Good morning, Bridge family. Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Can we get up as we get ready to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Psalms 18, 2 and 3 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. In my God who I take refuge, I call to the Lord who is worthy of all my praise. Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise, Lord. You are the reason why we come and we gather, Lord. If we come and gather in our our own name, there's no power in our name, Lord. But there's still power in the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, Father, Lord God, you're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our worship, Lord. We just thank you, Father God, who you brought here today, Lord. I think it's not by chance that anyone is here today. It's by your divine plan and purpose, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that the healer is in the room. The deliverer is in the room. The redeemer is in the room, Lord. Abba, Father, we acknowledge you even right now. We acknowledge your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the anointing that destroys every yoke and removes every burden, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you're calling us, Father God. True worshipers must worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. I just thank you, Father God, right now, Lord. We give this time to you, Lord. We don't want to control this room, Lord. We want to move this room with your presence, with your glory, with your anointing, Lord. I come against religion even right now, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we just go through the motions, Lord, and hear any other songs, Lord. They're not just words that we're singing. We're saying, worthy are you, Lord. You're worthy of it all, Lord. For from you and through you and to you are all things. You are worthy of it all. So, Father God, I just give this day to you. This service is yours, Lord. Minister to every single one of us today, Lord. In Jesus' name, we worship you. Amen. Worship with me. If you don't know what to do, worship. Except 
Everything 
God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. suffering you're here with me in the darkness you never leave God of mercy you're walking with me I surrender anxiety all this striving has to cease in this moment you're still the king this is the gift you are giving to me. A sound mind for the spirit of fear. A sound mind so that I could see clearly. A sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind. There's a table where we meet in the presence of my enemies. I will listen, I will feast on every word you are speaking to me. I remember who you are. You're my fortress and my God. I will stand in authority in jesus name all this darkness will flee a sound mind for the spirit of fear a sound mind so that i could see clearly a sound mind your spirit is here a sound mind a sound You say 
saved, healed, delivered me. Jesus' blood wash over me. Command my soul awake, arise. Use each breath to prophesy. I prophesy. You saved, healed, delivered me. Jesus' blood wash over me. Command my soul awake, arise. Use each breath to prophesy. I prophesy. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, you are so good. We're nothing without your presence, Lord. Lord, we just worship you because you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy of it all, God. You are worthy of all of our praise. You're worthy of our song. You're worthy of every breath in our lungs, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Guys, we have open communion up here. If you feel led, you can just come forward and take communion. We have it on either side of the stage. Oh, I'm going 
you'll see Till my heart starts changing Oh, I'm gonna worship Till I mean every word Cause the way I feel And the fear I'm facing Doesn't change who you are Oh, what you deserve I give you my worship You still deserve it You're worthy, you're worthy You're worthy of my song I pour out your praises Blessing and breaking You're worthy, you're worthy You're worthy of my song Stop singing your praise, amen. In the blessing and the pain, you are worthy. Whether you say yes or no, away, you are worthy. Through it all, I choose to say.
Isn't God good? Amen. Well, why don't you greet somebody next to you? Give somebody a hug you don't know. Well, isn't he worthy of it all? Man, he's worthy of it all. No matter what you're dealing with, no matter what situation you're in right now, just remember that he's worthy of it all. From him and through him and to him are all things. He deserves the glory. My name is Carmelo Hernandez, and I'm going to give the tithe and offering message uh, today. Um, again, like what I talked about last week. How many of you guys remember that passage of scripture I, I used last week for tithe and offering announcements, which was that the love of money is the root of all evil. Raise your hand if you remember that verse. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, you guys are right. You guys remember. But what I said, I tricked you guys. I said that by a lot of people, they misquote that, and they say that money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. The Lord wants you to have money, but, the Lord, but it doesn't have to have you. You can have money, but don't allow the money to have you. Don't worship money. Worship the Lord. It says this in Proverbs eleven twenty eight. 28. This is a passive scripture I'm going to share with you guys today regarding tithes and offerings. Whoever, who? Whoever trusts in his riches will fail. Don't trust in your own riches. It says it will fail. It's a promise. Sometimes we think like, man, like, oh, I made this money or I did this. Yes, we work hard, but do we realize on who it gave to us? Who gave us the breath in our lungs to be able to get up and work and provide for our families? But it's always about I, I, I. Be careful when you guys say that. That could be a form of pride. Come on, somebody. I could do nothing apart from Jesus, but here goes. But I can do all things through him who give me strength. Amen? But that's the reason we're like tithing offerings. Why do we give? It's a principle of our first fruits. Like do we realize and have that revelation that, Lord, it's because of you, Lord, that I'm going to trust you. You're the one who provides all of my finances, Lord. You're the one who protects my family. You're the one who gives me a house. Lord, that you will supply all of my riches according to your riches in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. But it says this, whoever trusts in his riches will fall. But, there's always a but, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. The righteous are supposed to live by faith. The righteous live by faith. That's what, like we live and we walk by faith and not by sight. Don't look at the circumstances inside of you. That's why I always say I'm really, like the Lord's really teaching me right now. You know what happens to Christians? I'm going to be real and honest. There's a lot of carnal Christians. I love you guys. I love you guys. I'm not preaching, but I'm going to give a little message really quick. Carnal Christians, meaning that they go off their mind, their will, and their emotions. That's the soulish realm. But Jesus says, true worshipers must worship me in spirit and in truth. Come on, somebody. Not the soul, not the mind, the will, and the emotions. Like, Lord, wait, what do you mean? What is this money? Why should I give? You know what so many people say? Why do you give? Why do you, bless? Why do you do that? Man, and why wouldn't I give? I've had that revelation that him, Jesus, is the reason. he supplies all of my needs. It's not that I have to give. I get to give. And because of that, Lord, I can live with my hands wide open. But it's not even a guy. Like, again, it's about a heart. Where's your heart at right now? If you have a stony heart. If you have a hard heart, and then again, you don't got to be telling people, oh, I gave this, I give this. The Lord sees what you give. Amen. You don't got to tell nobody what you did. But a lot of people need a lot of recognition. Oh, I did this, or I did this, or I gave. That's not from the Lord. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. Why are you giving? If you're only giving out of, like, who could see me give, you're coming from the wrong heart. Like, but if you come like, Lord. You gave your son for me, Lord. You gave everything to me. And because of that, Lord, I can't help but, get, but to give. I can't help but pray. I can't help but intercede. I can't help but love the hell out of the people that come in front of me that are lost and broken and hurting. It's a principle of life. Freely we receive and freely we give away. Why? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave it all. Did he hold anything back? Where in our life are we holding anything back unto the Lord? From him and through him are all things. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Again, what's your why behind your giving right now? You got to check your guys' heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, that's the reason why you guys give. If you have that revelation, like, man, Lord, thank you, Father, that I'm able to be a provider for my family. Not because of me, Lord, but because of you. 
Amen? So, Father God, I just thank you, Father God, for every single one of my brothers and my sisters here that so, like, faithfully give unto you, Lord. They're not giving unto us. They're giving unto you, Lord. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, may they have the revelation, Lord, that from you, you're the one who supplies all their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus, Lord. So I just bless every single one of my brothers and my sisters right now in Jesus' name. Every said? Amen. Amen. All righty. So those are the announcements. With that being said, let's give uh, Pastor Phil a round of applause. Come on up here. All right, let's pray for Pastor Phil. Lord Jesus, I just thank you, Father God, for Pastor Phil, Lord. I just thank you, Father God, for the word that you put on his heart today, Lord. And I just thank you, Father God, he is your chosen man today to deliver your word, Lord. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, may you soften people's hearts so they can receive the word that you put on his heart. So may you speak through him today. And we just bless him right now from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Go ahead, Pastor Phil. Thank you, buddy. You guys, uh, I am so grateful to be here with you today. Some of you don't even know who I am. Sometimes I don't even know who I am. I'm Pastor Phil, Pastor P. I was the one who was working with the church that was in this room for, oh, 20, almost 15, 20 years, I guess, share. And uh, it's amazing what God can do, you guys. He promised me that he would help us to touch every life in Santa Maria. And that was way back in 1987. And I want you to know that God is faithful to his word. Here we are back here in this very room that we put together so many years ago. God is not finished with me yet. Amen? Come on, some of you that really believe, say amen. amen. Okay, just because I'm old does not mean you can't say amen, okay? Why don't you stand? You've been sitting for about three minutes and... Uh, I want to read you the scripture this morning found in Ephesians 1, 3 through 12 about. And I, I started this series about three sermons ago. And it's really important that we realize that we are prized possessions. Can you say that? I am a prized possession. Come on, those that believe it. I am a prized possession. Turn to somebody and say, I'm not sure about you. Okay, all right. As you will find out, I like to have a lot of fun. In fact, I've been kicked out of better churches than this. Uh, I don't know. Ephesians 1 says, Praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Say in Christ. Now I'll keep repeating it. For he chose us, he chose us, get it, in him before the creation before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined. Can you say predestined? predestined. Now that is fighting words for some people. I want you to know. Predestined us for adoption to sonship and daughtership through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. That's us. In him, we have redemption. Say that with me. In him, we have redemption. It's really important for you to grasp because that's the reason I have this sermon today. Turn to somebody and said, you're a blessing to me. All right, be seated. Got a, I got a text message last night from my granddaughter-in-law, and uh, I am so old that I even know how to text, I want you to know. And uh, she sent a text message and said, and asked the question, she said, did God know us before we were born? And I all, it just popped right into my head, Psalms 139, it says, you know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know uh, me before I took one breath. Your eyes saw me in my mother's inner part. You know, a lot of people don't believe that they're here on purpose. You are here on planet Earth on purpose, you guys. You are a gift from God to many, many people. And I know uh, a lot of people have come to me in times past and say, I don't feel worthy. Well, it's time for you to get off your worry wart. 
Anyway, and realize that you are a prized possession of God. He has a plan for your life that is unbelievable. And you that came this morning thinking that Justin was going to speak, too bad. He's, yeah, come on, is right. He's over speaking, I believe, at his father-in-law's church at the Clippers today. And he's sharing what we have been hearing from him for months and months and months, that God is the way, the truth, and the life. And pray for him this morning, you guys. So important for us to pray for each other. As I sent the message back to my daughter-in-law, she was thrilled to realize that she's not a mistake. Satan, the liar of our soul, has said, you're a mistake. I want you to know he's mistaken about that right now. He is fooled because God intended for you to be here. And you that get up and leave the church service early today, you're intended to stay here the whole service. Okay, enough messing around here. Buried treasure. So many people, in fact, I see old guys. I'm not sure when I'm going to get old, but I had a birthday this last Saturday or Sunday, I guess. And you guys all sang to me. Not all of you, because some of you were really terrible singers, I want you to know. But I was over in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Justin sent me the text message of you guys singing. And it was so wonderful to hear that guy off key on the front row and yet see the smile on his face. There's a joy in getting older if you know Jesus Christ has the future in his hands. Amen, you guys? So just realize today that God is not finished with me yet. And I want to thank you for believing with me that God's not through with me yet because you came this morning and you probably knew that I was going to preach. That is awesome. I want you to know. We have a redeemer. That's where I start this morning. I have a redeemer. You have a redeemer. And I've often just jumped and glossed over that word redeemer. I've never really taken it into consideration exactly what God meant when he gave Paul this scripture here, he said, in him we have redemption. And probably like many of you, I never really studied that word redemption. What does it really mean? And I began to look at the Greek, and some of you say, you have trouble with English, much less Greek. What are you doing, Pastor Phil? Well, I'm starting to learn the Greek language. The first thing that I learned about redemption is that it means to purchase. And a lot of you ladies know what it means to purchase, right? Uh, I heard an oh yeah back there. I'm telling you, when oh, here I go off on a rabbit trail. When we went to Hawaii the first time, I remember Sherry getting off the plane. We went up to Diamond Head and I said, man, I can't wait to get out in that surf. And have fun in the water. You know how you just want to take off your clothes like you see it? <laughs> Boy, you didn't expect that, did you? I did. I wanted to just jump and wear my underwear right into the water. But what did Sherry see? Sherry saw what she called cute little shops, cute little shops. Now, I didn't know much about cute little shops until I got there to Hawaii. And she says, tomorrow morning, we're going to go through those shops. And I said, oh, praise God. I can't wait to go through those little shops. Cute little shops. You know those little benches that are out in front of the stores? They're for guys that can't stand the cute little shops. They were meant for us, I want you to know. And she started going in and out. She calls herself a scout. Am I right? Yes, sister. Anyway, she calls herself a scout. And what that means, guys, is they go through the first cute little shop. They go through the second cute little shop. They go through the third cute little shop, and by the 20th one, I said to her, what in the world are you looking for? She says, I'm looking for just the right thing. 
I says, I've already found it at the first shop. So we go back to the first shop, and she literally buys the first item that she said was wonderful. I says, what are you doing that for? She says, I'm going to give it to Brittany. That really helps Brittany. She'll really like it. She's a knick-knack girl, and she'll put stuff up on the walls. You ever been to her house? She's got knick-knacks everywhere. I want you to know. So Sherry wanted to get, they are scouts, guys. You know what a guy will do? A guy's kind of stupid. I didn't hear an amen from one woman there. A guy will say to himself, hey, my battery's low. I need to change my battery. You know what a guy will do? He will go to the first auto parts that he can find, and he'll buy a battery and take it home. He doesn't scout around. That's what the difference between men and women. They're scouts, and we are hunters. Da, 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 da. Hallelujah. I'm glad I came to church this morning. Now, we put up extra seats back there on the back row, so we're here to hear the word of God, Pastor Phil. I had a lady one time stand up in the service. She stood up and shook her Bible at the other pastor, not me, <laughs> of course. And she said, we came to hear the word. And I said, wow, did you get a hearing aid? You know, anyway, we, I was a cut and I shouldn't have said it. I'm sorry. Moving on along here, this first Greek word here, which is given to us here, redemption literally means to purchase. All the women in this room and guys should actually know what that means. I never really thought about purchasing something. It's, I think of buying a car, buying a house, buying something like that. I don't think about buying what Paul was talking about. What Paul was literally speaking about was to buy a person, go buy a slave. That's what was going on right here in Ephesus, the slave market. And you say, well, we don't have that problem now. Yes, we do. I know a lot of people that are a slave to sin, and they need to have their, their soul purchased by Jesus Christ. And if you don't know what I'm talking about now, it's time for you to wake up and smell the roses. We, t we don't talk about purchasing people in our society, but back then, every other person, every, one person to two slaves in the nation. So this was radical. This was horrible. This is what Paul was talking about here. You were purchased. You were bought with a high price. And that's what we just celebrated in Easter. You have been bought by the blood of the lamb. And we need to get a hold of that. The second meaning to this word is not that you were purchased, but you were purchased and purchased out of. You were taken out of your sin that you were in. So many people want to hang out where they used to hang out. I want you to know something. You cannot hang out in the old bar that you used to hang out in. You can't hang out in the old pornography that you used to look at. You can't hang out in disobeying what God wants you to do and have God's blessing in your life. Good preaching, Pastor Phil. I'm with you. Keep it up, buddy. Okay, I hear Carmel always saying, Come on now. I don't know quite what that means, but I'm starting to learn what it means. Come on now. The third part of that meaning for redemption, redemption is to receive or set free from. Not only to go and purchase, not only to take them away, but to set them free. That's what this means. You buy the person, and then you set them free to go as they will. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. He bought you, he paid for you, and he, bought, he brought you out, and then he didn't put you to work. He set you free to be you. Man, don't you like who you are? I like many of you, some of you more than others. Um, he set us free. Absolutely, that's what this word says here. This is what Christ has done for us. He paid the ultimate price. He paid the price for our salvation. And we need to realize by his blood, we have been bought. In our society today, we don't quite understand the blood-bought view. You remember the song, the blood that Jesus 
shed for me. Boom, boom, boom. Way back on Calvary, the blood. What's the next word? That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power, for it reaches. <clears throat> Sometime I'm going to ask my, my kids to come up here and sing with me that song. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to where? The lowest valley. Okay, you guys on the back row that are getting ready, getting your purse, I see it. Okay. The blood has its power. Where did that all come from? What about the blood? Is it the same today? Is this a bloody religion? Yeah. It is. That's what Calvary is all about. Back in the Old Testament, God told Moses, he said, stand up and prophesy. Stand up and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And I'm standing up against Satan this morning and saying, let my people go. Set them free. Why? Because the blood still has the power. He says to Pharaoh, Moses, he says, can you let our people go? Then this, this won't come upon you. Well, there was the frogs. There was the lice. There was the death of the cattle. There was the blood in the river. Remember that? How stinky would the Nile River be? Can you imagine? All blood. How about the storm that came? Anyway, and Pharaoh said, I will not let your people go. And finally, the scripture says, Moses, go to Pharaoh and say, for I will go through the land. This is Exodus 12, 12. For I will go through the land. God is about ready to go through this land. You may not believe it. You may not understand it. But I want to tell you something. We're about ready to see the hand of God move. He said, my children, my people, that's us. That be me. That be you. They will know of my return. Everybody I talk to today is saying, I think it's the last days. Well, I do too think it's the last days, but I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in. I'm going to occupy till he returns. Okay, got to move on here. So he said to Pharaoh in Exodus 12, for I will go through the land of Egypt on the night and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men, firstborn, and the beasts, the animals, and against all the gods of Egypt. He has just shown who's boss with all the gods of Egypt in all of the plagues that he brought and showed them they have no power. I want to tell you something today. Satan may be scaring you to death. I'm going to tell you right now, Satan has no power over those who will stand up and say, I am God's child, and by his stripes, I am going to stand up and take a walk with the Lord. Have you ever walked with the Lord before? I'll tell you what, it's a great thing, but a scary thing. I walked out in front of all of Reggetti's high school football team, all of the people in the stands. One person that knew me said, I know Pastor P, Pastor Phil. He'll go out in the middle of the, of the field and he'll pray for us. I remember walking out in the middle of that field with two or 3,000 people, and my legs would hardly move. Why? I was so afraid. But then when I got ready to pray, the anointing of the Lord came upon me, and I told them, repent. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, that's not what I said. But it's what I intimated when I was standing out in the middle of the field. And a lot of people understood that I'm on God's side and God's on my side. It's time for you to get a hold of the idea. You're not alone. God is on your side and God is on. He says, I will go throughout the land and both men and beasts 
And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. You need to get a hold of that, you guys. He's still the same. And the blood shall be a sign. Get a hold of this right now. Even to this day, we hear about Passover. And that's what he says. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When Satan looks at you, he looks at you as raw meat. God looks at you and sees his blood and he cannot see all the sins that you did in the past because when you ask him for redemption, I want to tell you, when you've asked him for redemption, when you have asked him for redemption, your past is gone forever. And I believe, I believe it's gone so far that there's no end to it, that it, that's how far it has been removed. As far as the east is from the west. Got to move on here. So the second point I want to talk to you about today is forgiven. Forgiveness. Have you been forgiven? <laughs> yeah. I want to challenge you on this. It says in him, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood that I just talked to you about. The forgiveness of our what? Trespasses. That's an old word, you guys, trespasses. That means sin. That's stuff that we have done. Have you ever cut somebody off on the freeway and said, you deserved it? Get back there, you sucker. I used to ride a motorcycle all the time. It was a blast. They never knew who I was. Bob and Diane didn't even know me. I want you to know I had my leathers on. Yeah, look cool. I had my helmet on with that flip down visor and it had that special coating on it that you can't see in, but I can see out. It's like x-ray vision. I can remember going on the, from the 101 to the 405 down there. I had a blast until a cop showed up. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I'm forgiven. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I love front row. They've heard it 17 times. The good news is, is that we can be forgiven. That's what that forgiveness of our trespasses, the things that's happened. Our family will remember them against us, all of the things that we did back there, but God will remember them no more. The proper understanding here is when you have not been forgiven, you are condemned to die. What that means is this scripture right here is really saying a distance from God. You are removed from God's presence. The good news is that Christ took our blame, our guilt, and our sin upon himself that we just celebrated for Easter. We say, thank you, Father. And then we go down to the, the application of being forgiven. Here's the sign of you know that you're forgiven. Now write this down. All of you that are taking notes, get ready. Here's the line. When you are forgiven, you forgive other people. Hang on to that right now. I'll, I'll, I'll prove it. I'll prove it in just a second. There is a practical application here. Forgiven, forgi forgiven people forgive other people is what I'm saying. It says there in the Lord's Prayer. And I heard somebody quoting the Lord's Prayer this morning in praise and worship. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, we want to reverse that. If you don't forgive, am I not forgiven? What is the deal here, Pastor? I didn't come to church to be condemned. Well, you came to the wrong guy. I want to tell you something here. It says in Matthew 6, right after the Lord's Prayer, it says, For if you forgive men their transgressions, transgressions your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your father will not forgive your trespasses. Hang on to that right now, you guys. A beautiful lady in our church came up to me, and uh, Elaine came up to me, and she was the most godly woman. You'd look at her and you'd say, 
she looks like an angel. And she did, by the way. And I got on this scripture right here, and I was speaking about if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. And she came to the, the front where the altar was. At the end of the service, she said, Pastor Phil, I want you to know I have an unforgiving spirit. I said, what? You would never know by looking. You know, Christians are real good at looking good. They shine up their halo. Their little wings are, are ready to fly at any moment, you know. I want to challenge you guys. She stood there, and everyone in the church would have, if you were a betting person, would have said, Elaine is. See, the reason I'm using her name right now, she's in heaven. She died. She was a wonderful lady. But she said, I've not forgiven my mother for what she did to me when I was a child. She favored my sister and not me. And she began to tell me about all of the things that her mother did. I says, that's easy. We just ask Jesus to forgive us of that sin. And then we get up and we walk as though we've never had that in our life. All of that anger that you had. And she certain, she's one of those women have you ever met a woman that smiles at you and you know that she could cut your heart out? <laughs> or a guy that will look at you and say, hey, God bless you, brother. And you know that he has been out screwing around the night before. I want to challenge you. She got victory that morning over this scripture right here. I want to be forgiven. So I forgave my mom, she said. I said, victory in the camp. Hallelujah. The Lord has set you free. And I buried her five years later. And I want to tell you, it was the most glorious coronation, just like Charles being coronated yesterday as king of England. Well, it's the same way with Elaine when she died. Everybody stood around and said, hallelujah. Elaine's in heaven with Michael. What happens you get saved, you ask God to forgive you, but you still hate the people that you used to hate. That can't be. That's what Paul is talking about here. In him we have redemption through his blood, yes, the forgiveness of our trespasses. There's always a statement that says, if you will do this. We don't like the ifs. If we forgive not men. This principle, forgiven people, I really have found this to be true. And I'm old enough, by the way. I had a birthday the other day. Did I tell you? You weren't there. Oh, thank you all that sent me a birthday card, all six of you. I appreciate it so much. It was really beautiful. And I had such a great time celebrating with you. But I want you to know, I've lived long enough now to know. All of the people that say they're Christians are not. Now, I want to challenge you this morning. Don't go around looking under their leaves and see if they have fruit. Because that's what I've heard all my life. I'm a fruit inspector. But did you know what that scripture says? It says, forgive and we will be forgiven, as I read to you here. I want to challenge you. God knows the fruit that we're producing. I want to challenge you. The principle here is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do is what he said on the cross. Now, when he was on the cross, we heard a song, I was on his mind. What it means is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He wasn't praying for the Guards that gambled for his cloak. He wasn't praying for all of the Sanhedrin, the ugly Sanhedrin who said they knew more about God than anybody else. They weren't, he wasn't saying about Pilate who was strong enough to have stopped the whole thing. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not. You ever been there? When you didn't know what you were doing was wrong, I've been there before. I've said things that I shouldn't have said. I've used people's names that I shouldn't have used. But I want you to know, God knows if I meant to hurt them or if I meant to lift them up. 
Get that this morning. God knows our heart. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I'm almost done. The last point is this. We have grace. Going on to the verse here in, in, in uh, Ephesians 1, 8, it says, in him we have redemption, as I said, through his blood, the forgiveness, number two, of our trespasses, number three, it, and it says, according to his riches of his grace. Many of us don't understand what grace is today. It's unfavored, unmerited, undeserved love of God. And it's kind of interesting. It says here, forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. You got to realize, according to the riches of his grace, how much grace does he have? Does he have enough for me? I want to tell you, you can't go deep enough in sin that he can't forgive you. There's nothing that you could do that would take God away from you. There's no sin that can be committed that God can't forgive. Satan is a liar. A big, wait a minute. He's not a fat liar. He's probably a skinny liar because he doesn't get to eat the fruit of the spirit. Anyway, I want to challenge you. I turned 80 years old on Saturday, as I started to say. And I want you to know 80 is nothing. How long shall a man live, God? Is it Methuselah, 996 years old? Some of you are going through your Bibles right now, going to find it wrong. It wasn't 996. A lot of age. But when sin entered the earth through Adam and Eve, from that point on, if you do a chart, you will find that the age of mankind diminished and diminished and diminished and diminished and diminished. We were never meant to die, you guys. Some of you wonder, when is that guy going to die? He's still running around. That's me. When I lose my teeth, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to gum Satan to death. Why do you use humor, Pastor? Because look around. God made some funny-looking people. He has a way about it. But anyway, sin entered the earth and death became the norm. And then after Adam, then down to Moses, and then down to, who's the guy on the boat? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? The word came that a man's age should be no more than 120 years old and then it was given later by Moses said, 80 years should be the span of a man. Unless he's married to Mrs. Noah. His lifespan would be 60 years old. <laughs> I'm done. In 1930, and I wasn't alive then. <laughs> 1930, there was a man by the name of John D. Rockefeller. He was the richest man on planet Earth. And every Sunday, they said, that he would go upstairs, he would get dressed in his double-breasted suit. He'd put on his top hat. He looked like a million dollars, or should I say a billion dollars. And he would walk all over Manhattan, New York. And in his pocket, he would give out dimes to all of the kids. All of the kids would get a dime. I know we say here, what's the big deal about a dime? Well, if you take and multiply what the worth of a dime was, a dime back then, nowadays would be worth 10 bucks. So I'll be at the back of the church if any of you want to give me 10 bucks. You follow what I'm saying, guys? It was a value. And we'd say, man, he is a wealthy man. And they would give him glory. But this is what he should have done, I believe. He should have saw those little boys and girls and said, not a dime for you, not $10 for you, but I'm buying you a ranch out here. 
I'm buying a, a, a limousine to come and pick you up every day and a driver that will drive you back. You'll never have to pay for your lunch again or your groceries again. I'm going to give this to you. We would say that, and I wrote it down here if I can remember, he's giving out of the abundance of his worth. You see, that's what God has done for us on Calvary. He gave to us our forgiven souls back to us. Satan had us by the short hair, but God used the knife and cut us free from all of the junk. And today, all of the junk that has held you back, God wants to give you. How rich is God, you guys? And I take it the next step. How rich is God in grace? Unmerited favor, unmerited love. What you don't deserve. How rich is he? I believe he has more grace than you can imagine today. I read a story here, and I'm, I think it's so cool. If you know the punchline, don't blot it out. You know when you get old, all of your punchlines have been heard already. There was a, the king of Saudi Arabia that had built a golf course over there around his kingdom. And he sent a message to one of the great golfers in America and said, will you come to my kingdom and will you play golf with me for three or four days and then I'll fly you back? Well, the guy, professional golfer says, this is easy. You bet. I'll come to the king of Saudi Arabia's place. I would like to see even his house that he has. It'd be great. So they flew him on a private jet from America all the way to Saudi Arabia. And he played round after round after round. If he was smart, he would have not done real well with the wall. He would have let the king win. But he was there with the king. And as he was leaving on the airplane, the king came to him the king of Saudi Arabia came to him and said now that you've come to my land where I am what would you like to have I'll give you anything in the world <laughs> how would you like that you guys I'll give you anything that you want and the golfer said hey no 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 he said it was my pleasure coming here to be with you I really enjoyed my time here. That food was fantastic. That camel meat is really tough. Uh, a friend of mine was over there, and I'm not going to go down that road, Sherry. Okay. He said, the food is not all that good over there. It's not Americanized yet with all of the carbs and stuff. Anyway, as he was standing, he says, what would you like to have? And finally, the guy said, to be polite to him, he says, why don't you give me a golf club? I, I love, I, I collect golf clubs and you can just send me one. And the king of Saudi Arabia said, no problem, I'll send you one. He got back and as he was flying on the airplane, it's like you and me, he was probably in his mind thinking, I wonder if it's got diamonds on it or I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if it's solid gold. And when he landed, he went to his house in about two weeks, a letter comes in the mail. And he looks at the letter and he's kind of disappointed. He says, here's the king and there's his signature. But how could he get my golf club in that envelope? He opened up the envelope and it says, first deed title to a 500 acre golf course in America. The man almost fell on his face. Why? We put God in the little box. I want you to expand what God wants to do for you this morning and realize he has enough grace to get you past that, that time when someone, like they did me, they sexually abused me when I was a little boy. You may not think you could get past it. I want to tell you something. I am victorious over it right now. My brothers, one time, they tied my feet together, tied my hands behind my back, 
I'm the youngest of six guys, you guys got to realize that. And they hoisted me up in the top of the cherry tree. It's funny when I think about it now. But I want you to know, I was able to forgive them. And I did their funerals, all of them. What's that mean? Forgiven people, forgive. Don't be bondage to, my mom didn't treat me right. Don't be in bondage to my dad didn't come to my games. Don't be in bondage to some church that said that you could be on staff and they fired you later. Don't be under that constant thing where Satan will keep bringing it up. I want to tell you something. Forgiven people forgive people. Unforgiven people do not forgive people. We had a guy the other day that was very, very naughty to me. And Sherry said, I'm so proud of you. You didn't say a word to him. In the old days, well, it's easier to have a right spirit when you're 80 years old. Whenever you're in your 30s and 40s, it's really fun to slug the guy and then say, God save him, you know? I got the approval of my wife who said, I'm so proud of you that you didn't say anything back to those people. You know, God will get even with whatever it is, but you, first you need to be redeemed. Then you need to receive God's forgiveness. And then you need to move on to forgiving those who have done something very bad against you. Maybe you're at that stumbling place where you're right there at that wall and you can't get past it because that, that was so, that was so wrong what they did to me. Well, it was so wrong when they put Jesus on the cross and they hung him up. And not only did they say, King of kings and Lord of lords, put that over his head. They mocked him. He wasn't up in the air. He was only 18 to 20 inches off the ground. So the people could come, spit on him, and they did. They said, you're the king. Come on down from that and set us free. I want to tell you something. Jesus said, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, in your name, as we close the service today, I pray that you would help every soul that's here to realize they are candidates for heaven that you made a place for them but unless they have the redemption of your spirit the purchase the purchase out of and the purchase set free and then the blood to wash away our sins we will not enjoy the joy of knowing you Jesus so I'm just going to close I, I just really feel it it's imperative that I say, I'd like the pray, praying team to come up here and be prayer warriors with us and counselors. But if there's anybody in here right now that has something in your life that you just, I can't forgive for that. It's time for you to let go of that thing that Satan has been holding to you like a fish that's just been caught that can't get off the hook. Father, I pray for these people to have enough courage to stand up, come down here, Lord, and receive the forgiveness. And by coming down here, they will be able to say, I forgive my mother. I forgive my dad. I forgive my brother. I forgive that preacher. I forgive that church. I forgive that nation. I forgive that government. And if they will, Lord, they will enjoy the riches of the inheritance of a forgiven society. Will you all stand with me right now? All of you, y'all? Bowed heads, closed eyes. Would you step out? Would you have enough courage just to step out and come down here and just say to these guys, I have an unforgiving spirit. I am unforgiven. Yes, anybody else? I know that there's hundreds of us I've been there a thousand times myself. 
Come down here and take the hand of one of these people here. Come down here and say, I'm one of those guys that's been walking in unforgiveness. Therefore, I haven't been able to forgive that coach that let me down. <laughs> I remember him. That neighbor that did that stuff. That principal of the school that put me up in front of the rest and embarrassed me. Just step out. Anybody else? Come on. Come on, folks. It's just us and God's Spirit here. I preached a short sermon today. So I just want you to know, God will be with you a long, long time with a forgiven spirit. God, as we walk out of here today, may we realize by your blood I have been set free. By the power of your blood, Lord, I am redeemed. Not just redeemed to be purchased, not just redeemed to be singled out, but redeemed and let free to be me. Lord, you created Phil to be Phil. What a mess I thought I was until I gave my heart to you and you made me into a new creature. Wow, what a difference I am now. Why did I wait so long? Why did I wait until I was almost dead before I realized that you forgave me when mankind would not? Go with us as we go our way today, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, for your mercy, which endures forever and ever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I close this service. Amen. You're dismissed, guys, and thank you for being here. And if you need any help, come and be with these people, if you will. God bless you.